it's the usual format, two respondents in turn, followed by open, open discussion. Uh, I'm going to say this for the first time. I'm going to say it probably three times all told. When we leave, please make sure that you remove from this uh, lecture theatre any cups, saucers, cutlery, or anything else that you brought into it. I'll be saying this again because you probably won't remember. <laughs> so our first respondent is Joel. Thanks, Joel, very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dennis. Uh, so I'm going to uh, just talk about a few things. Uh, I just want to make a brief point to start with about quantum mechanics versus platonic dualism and about the historical versus the experimental sciences. And then I want to spend most of the time <clears throat> talking about uh, cosmic inflation, eternal inflation, and uh, I'm going to end uh, with a rather elaborate video. Uh, now, I just wanted to uh, remind you of another uh, little quotation from uh, Stephen Hawking's Brief History of Time. Uh, Hawking tells a well-known story of how an eminent astronomer was giving a lecture and explained how the Earth goes around the sun and the sun goes around the center of the galaxy and so on. And at the end of the lecture, a little old lady in the back of the room objects that this is all rubbish and that, in fact, the Earth is just the back of a giant tortoise. And the learned scientist smirks and says, well, what is the tortoise standing on? And the answer the little old lady gives is, it's turtles all the way down. <laughs> and of course, uh, one of our jobs is to try to avoid this sort of infinite regress. And uh, one of the uh, possible successes of this inflationary approach to cosmology is that it may do that. Uh, but I wanted to start by just talking a little bit about quantum mechanics and the amazing nature of quantum mechanics. And this is actually uh, a point that Julian Barber also mentioned. So what these are actually slices through uh, the first few states of a hydrogen atom described by uh, static solutions to the Schrodinger equation, or uh, as Julian said, the time-independent Schrodinger equation. And these seem, as far as we can tell, to exactly describe nature. This is for the simple case of a hydrogen atom, but of course similar things can be found for more complex atoms and also for molecules. So Plato claimed that what's real are the forms. They're the uh, things that are uh, everlasting and true, and physical objects are poor representations of the forms. But according to quantum mechanics, atoms and other quantum structures, including molecules, are purely mathematical figures. Since the physical universe is made of such quantum structures on a small scale, this challenges Plato's dualism. Quantum mechanical stability is, in fact, extremely relevant to us. It's the basis of genetics, as Schrodinger first speculated in uh, his remarkable lectures at uh, uh, the uh, Institute for Advanced Study in Dublin, uh, which was published as a book, What is Life, in 1944. And uh, Francis Crick said that this was a great inspiration to him in figuring out, uh, along with uh, Watson, the structure of DNA. Uh, now, the second point I wanted to make has to do with uh, the historical versus the experimental sciences. Uh, it's become popular, uh, especially uh, among uh, the uh, fundamentalist Christians in the United States, to regard the experimental sciences as being somehow uh, more true or more reliable than the historical sciences. The historical sciences are cosmology and, in fact, much of astronomy, geology, paleontology, and, in fact, all of evolutionary biology. The purpose of the historical sciences, basically, is to reconstruct the past, to allow us to understand how the world got to be the way it is. And the standard objections include uh, one that I think George Ellis made, that uh, since uh, our past is a unique thing, uh, it's not, in fact, the subject of science. I think George actually said that. Uh, I think you said it specifically about cosmology. Uh, when I was uh, a undergraduate at Princeton, I had the privilege of taking a senior seminar. I wasn't a senior at the time, uh, with Carl Hempel. Uh, 
which was his presentation to us of what became his book, Aspects of Scientific Explanation, which is really a philosophy of the historical sciences. And what Hempel emphasized is that the pattern of scientific explanation is absolutely identical in the historical sciences and in the experimental sciences. Basically, both are judged on the success of their predictions about new knowledge, whether that knowledge is gleaned from experiments or from observations about these historical sciences, cosmology, geology, and evolutionary biology. This goes back at least as far as the atomists. Uh, I hadn't appreciated how fragile our uh, connection with the atomists was until I read uh, a review of Greenblatt's book, uh, The Swerve, in a recent issue of the New York Times, uh, in which uh, he pointed out that uh, our knowledge of De Rerum Natura comes from one existing copy, and in fact, it's a copy of a copy. Pojo, uh, in the 14th century, discovered a copy in Latin. He had it copied, and it's copies of that copy that are the only uh, uh, copies we now have uh, of the original of uh, Lucretius's uh, De Rerum Natura, which of course was a, a sort of reworking of an earlier Greek uh, view of atomism that was due to Leucippus, Democritus, and Epicurus. But anyway, Lucretia says there, one, our age cannot look back to earlier things except where reasoning reveals their traces. And uh, this is the relevant quote, one of the relevant quotations anyway from Hempel. In history as anywhere else in empirical science, the explanation of a phenomenon consists of subsuming it under general empirical laws and the criterion of its soundness is exclusively whether it rests on empirically well-confirmed assumptions concerning initial conditions and general laws. And of course, it, it has to continue to be successful in predicting. So uh, just to emphasize that that's how cosmology works, three of the early successes of cosmology were the expansion of the universe, which was a deduction by Friedman and Lemaitre based on Einstein's uh, general relativity, Einstein himself, of course, tried to avoid this deduction, but uh, Einstein did recognize uh, in sending Friedman's paper on for publication uh, that it was a valid uh, hypothesis based on general relativity. Uh, the cosmic background radiation, as Bernard Carr mentioned, was predicted by Gamow, Alpha, and Herman in 1948, and they even got the temperature almost right. And uh, the details have been confirmed in a series of uh, observations which have, of course, continued up until the present day. And the abundances of the light elements uh, were worked out right after the first discovery of the, uh, the cosmic background radiation and by Penzias and Wilson in 65, first in a rough form by Jim Peebles and then uh, in a more detailed form, uh, which is sort of the basis of the modern treatment by Bob Wagner. Uh, well. To leap ahead to uh, contemporary understanding, uh, we have this picture of the heat radiation of the Big Bang all around us, uh, measured by the Wilson Microwave Anisotropy Probe, that's this gadget, uh, and now more recently by the Planck satellite, which hasn't yet released its data on this. It's still collecting the data, but it will ultimately have a map that's much more detailed than this one, much finer resolution. And of course, the first discovery uh, in great detail was by the Cosmic Background Explorer satellite, COBE. So COBE covered this small range of angles up to about seven degrees, 90 degrees to seven degrees. And uh, it was boomerang a uh, balloon flight around the South Pole and the Maxima balloon mission in 2000 <coughs> that first saw this first big peak. What this is saying is that the little spots of comparable temperature a few millionths of a degree uh, above absolute, above plus or minus, above uh, the 2.74 uh, degrees above absolute zero of the cosmic background radiation. Uh, the size of these spots is typically about one degree. So as Darwin said, God loves beetles because he made so many of them. God loves one degree. Or anyway, whatever the, the physics is that gave rise to this. Half a degree is disfavored, a third of a degree is favored, a quarter of a degree is disfavored, and so on. Now, the important thing to realize is that the theory predicted this curve long before any of the data was available. Every one of these white points is an independent observation. 
The colored points are independent observations from these ground-based detectors at the South Pole. And I've only shown you a tiny amount of the data. There's much more data on polarization and things like that. Every single point is in perfect agreement with the predictions of the theory. And this, again, only gives you a slight taste of the success of the theory. The same theory predicts the distribution of the galaxies, both in the early universe and nearby. And again, the agreement is spectacularly good. That's why we take such a theory so seriously. This is the theory that's based on cosmic inflation plus the composition of the universe being the mixture that Bernard mentioned to you, uh, a little bit of atomic matter, mostly dark matter and dark energy. We don't know what the dark matter and dark energy are, but we know enough about how they work to be able to do these kinds of theoretical predictions, which are, of course, in spectacular agreement, and that's why we take this so seriously. So the historical sciences work. And one more remark about uh, astronomy especially, it's a privileged historical science. The reason is that uh, the, uh, the other historical sciences suffer from a uh, tremendous lack of data due to destruction. Uh, geology is famously destructive. Mountains wear down uh, rather more, fa more rapidly than uh, the story about uh, once every thousand years, the bird with the, uh, the soft uh, uh, silk uh, uh, wears them down. They wear down much more rapidly than that. But fossils uh, are destroyed and many things don't fossilize. But astronomy is not like that. Almost every photon that was ever emitted in the history of the universe is still flying around in space and available for us to uh, examine and understand if we only can get the right instruments and develop powerful enough theories. And the triumph of astronomy in the last several decades has been precisely because, as Martin Rees pointed out last night, uh, governments have been willing to spend billions of dollars uh, putting very fancy technology uh, in places where these photons can be collected and understood. So. Uh, You've seen this figure a number of times, uh, borrowed, I might say, from uh, uh, the Terry lectures by Nancy and me in our earlier work. Uh, now what I want to do is spend most of the rest of this uh, talk, this brief talk, explaining how we think uh, creation might have happened. Uh, what I'm going to do is give the simplest version I know of cosmic inflation and uh, explain it and then illustrate it with a video. So the first point is that cosmic inflation takes the universe from a very small scale, about 10 to the minus 30 centimeters, up to the size of a newborn baby, roughly. All of this happens in an extremely brief time, something like 10 to the minus 32 seconds. And it happens by exponential expansion. In a tiny unit of that time, uh, this little piece of universe expands by a factor of two, and then in the same amount of time, another factor of two, and then the same amount of time, another factor of two, so it's exponential expansion. Then the universe stops expanding exponentially and in fact expands slower than any power of time. Excuse me, slower than first power of time. It expands as a power, but, but uh, t to the one half and then t to the uh, two thirds. So much slower than exponential <coughs> is what I meant to say. And so it takes a much longer time to reach the present size, which is basically the head of the serpent. What we're going to be more interested in is this first part, during which quantum effects can become important. So the first point is that, of course, on this very large scale, quantum effects couldn't possibly be important because the action, uh, the momentum times the distance, uh, is much, much larger than the quantum unit of action, H, Planck's constant. But back here, uh, the action is indeed uh, comparable to Planck's constant, and so quantum effects are extremely relevant. And then because of this enormous expansion, and then this enormous expansion, these quantum effects can be blown up to the size of galaxies and indeed the whole visible universe. So that's how it's possible for the quantum phenomena to become relevant, not just to life, but to the whole universe. So now what this is, is a story in words that is, as far as we can tell, 
an accurate description of the very simplest model that we know of cosmic inflation. So, and this is also uh, the, the thing that comes before cosmic inflation in this particular version. So eternal inflation and then cosmic inflation. The part up here is eternal inflation, the part down here is cosmic inflation and the creation of universes. So here's how it goes. Imagine, this is, this is cosmic Las Vegas, coins constantly flip, a head, the coin comes up heads, the coin is suddenly twice the size and there are two of them, and if it comes up tails, the coin shrinks to half its size. And the coins are constantly flipping. Consider a coin that has a run of tails. It becomes so small that it can pass through the grating in the floor. <coughs> At the instant it passes through the floor, it exits eternity. Time begins with a big bang, and it becomes a universe and starts evolving, and that's the multiverse. And the idea here is that each of these snowflake-looking things actually, there's one that's six-sided, but all the others aren't. So the idea is that the laws could be different in each of these different multiverses. Now, uh, this, of course, is only a, a story, but it actually is a mathematically correct description uh, of the simplest version of inflation I know, which is Andre Linde's uh, chaotic inflation with a parabolic potential. So uh, the idea is that there's something that measures how fast inflation is going, and it's also the potential of some field that we call the inflaton. But and it's represent the, the 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 possible things are represented by this curve. And there's also this negative curve, but let's focus on the positive side. It doesn't really matter which side you focus on. So the important thing is that the higher up you are, the higher up a little piece of universe is, to be precise, uh, the more important quantum effects are. The lower down you are, the more important classical effects are, and classical effects will always make this thing roll down very quickly. The quantum effects, on the other hand, are random they're equally likely to fluctuate up or fluctuate down. There's a dividing line. At this dividing line, the classical and quantum effects are equally important. If you're below the dividing line, the classical effects win, and very, very quickly, <coughs> the whole process has to come to an end. And when the little piece of universe reaches this region down here, it oscillates rapidly and the energy that was locked up in the inflation field, the so-called dark energy, converts to the energy of particles and radiation that just fill space, and there's a huge burst of entropy, and that's most of the entropy that was ever generated in the history of the universe until fairly recently with the production of supermassive black holes. In any case, uh, it's this dividing line where quantum effects were more important versus where classical effects that is just the force pulling a piece of the universe down and making inflation end is more important, that corresponds to this grading. That's where the grading comes in. So that's the idea. Now, the important point is that these quantum fluctuations are completely random, just like the coin flips. So the whole idea is that our entire universe, say this one, wasn't caused. It was simply a consequence of a series of random choices. Moreover, as the universe is going down very rapidly through, you know, 10 to the minus 32 seconds through this region, there are still quantum effects, but the quantum effects are now very subdominant. They're only a part in 10 to the fifth or so, 10 millionth. And it's those quantum effects that give rise to all the structure in the universe. That's where galaxies and clusters of galaxies and superclusters and voids and all of that stuff comes from, according to the modern theory. Appreciate that the theory makes detailed predictions about the nature of the fluctuations and then how they evolve, and it's those predictions that lead to the fabulous agreement in the slide just before and all these other agreements that I mentioned. And that's why this is a non-trivial uh, statement. However, as people have also mentioned, uh, George Ellis in particular, uh, this is just one of a literally infinite number of theories 
of uh, inflation. Uh, infinite, in fact, not just all of uh, null, but all of one, because uh, what goes in is actually uh, an infinite number of possible curves that describe not just one inflaton field, but in principle a very large number of inflaton fields. So, and all of this huge range lead to predictions similar to this, although not all of them, when you extrapolate back, lead to a multiverse. So the multiverse is very much contingent. The part that we can really test is this part. That's the inflation part. This is the cosmic, infl the, the eternal inflation part. Cosmic inflation, well tested. Eternal inflation, speculative. So now, let me just uh, conclude. Can we dim the lights? Uh, by showing you a, a pretty video, I think I have a few more minutes. Uh, so in this video, uh, there are going to be these bubbles, and you're going to see occasionally a, a bubble collide with another bubble. So the rules of the game are each of these bubbles is one of these, uh, uh, one of these uh, multiverses uh, that's created by a quantum fluctuation. And they exp each one expands at the speed of light, and they expand away from each other faster and faster, but not initially at the speed of light. And then their expansion away from each other is an inflationary expansion. So they move a certain distance apart in one unit of time, and then twice that distance in the next unit of time, and then twice again, and twice again, and so forth. The point is it starts slower, so there's a chance that the bubbles will collide. And you'll see a number of examples of collisions. So that's an example of a collision. And uh, there'll be this little thing which will just be guiding the eye. That's the center of coordinates. And uh, we made, it was Nancy's idea to make this video. And uh, my assistant uh, for doing these kinds of visualizations, uh, I'm the director of something called the University of California uh, High Performance Astro Computing Center. And uh, so Nina uh, is part of that, and she makes these beautiful videos. And this particular one uh, was made with the help of my Santa Cruz colleague, Anthony Aguirre. And it's his version uh, of quantum, uh, of uh, internal inflation, uh, where they, he and his uh, former graduate student, Matt Johnson, pointed out that you get these collisions. And the collisions would have the effect, if this, in fact, is the right version of inflation, that they would produce potentially uh, discoverable features in the uh, very high resolution images of the heat radiation of the Big Bang. They were carefully uh, searched for in the WMAP data and have not been found, contrary to a claim uh, by Roger Penrose. Uh, but there is hope that they will be found in the much higher resolution data that the Planck group is going to release sometime next year. So stay tuned. Uh, also, you'll see that sometimes these bubbles, as they grow, get dimmer and dimmer, and that's because they're moving away from us, not toward us. It'll all look like they're moving toward us, but if you look carefully, you'll see that the ones that get dimmer are moving away from us. Okay, well, enough of this preamble. Here's the uh, video. So universes are constantly being created. I think you may have just seen a collision there. That, these are these ones that are getting fainter are moving backward. And it doesn't matter what you take as the center, so we're going to move the center around, and uh, it'll all look more or less the same. I, th I think there were a couple of other collisions there. Uh, what we did is we actually programmed the equations uh, that describe the theory. And so sometimes these collisions happen, and sometimes they don't, and that corresponds to the predictions of the theory. Now, the idea is that our own bubble, including our entire observable universe, is one of these. So let's watch how that happens. There was another collision. OK, here goes. That's the cosmic background radiation. 
And these are the mapped quasars and galaxies mapped by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Nebula. And here we are back on Earth. No, I, uh, yeah, you don't want to follow a video of that kind. Uh, heavens, literally. Um, yes, so um, in my uh, brief presentation, I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, my own perspective as a Christian theologian, the kind of work that I do, raise, uh, and then raise some big questions, a couple of big questions that uh, seem to me to come out of the, the two presentations that we heard earlier. and. Um, address those two big questions a little bit from my own perspective as a Christian theologian. So yes, in my um, previous work I've uh, specialized in Christian beliefs about creation, God's relation to the world, uh, God's agency. Um, I thought that was might have been why I was invited to participate and not the, the recent uh, forays into economics. Um, but yeah, one's always speculating about this. Um, what I tend to do as a Christian theologian is to look for patterns of Christian discourse across the history of Christian thought, um, across the work of many different theologians, and looking not just for any old patterns, but uh, for formerly similar ways that different theologians are warping ordinary patterns of discourse in other fields in order to establish odd new rules for discourse about God and God's relation to the world that might have the effect of making more intelligible um, claims that Christians want to make about God and God's relation to the world. So for example, um, you know, I'm, I'm looking at Christian theologians and looking at the way in which they systematically modify understandings of uh, causality in order to bring together, uh, in order to help make sense of the way in which Christian theologians talk about God's own causality in relation to uh, causes within the world. Um, intelligibility here having to do primarily with um, an ability to see the compatibility of uh, the logical compatibility of the different sorts of claims that Christians are, are making. For example, that God is responsible for everything that's happening at the same time as we have free will. If, if those two claims are going to make sense together, you need to do some significant work, I think, modifying the usual understandings of causal efficacy uh, and uh, the way they're uh, brought into accounts of God's own agency. Um, I don't know whether that makes any sense to you, but that, that's the kind of thing that I do. And uh, as a Christian theologian, I tend to be uh, a classical theist, uh, meaning that uh, I tend to be affirming the usual traditional divine attributes, uh, omnipotence, for example, divine transcendence, uh, creation ex nihilo that was talked about yesterday. Um, and I guess I should also say, for purposes of, of 
this talk that uh, Aquinas is, is a backdrop for a lot of the, the, the kind of classical theist positions that I'm trying to unpack. Um, so the, the, the two presentations that we heard earlier, um, the one by Dean Zimmerman in particular, uh, raises for me uh, the big question of what kind of explanation is really being offered um, when uh, God is brought into the picture? I mean, if, if, the, if the question is why is there anything rather than nothing, um, and there's, there's some sense that, that God is uh, a way of answering that question, what kind of explanation is this? Is it an explanation that's actually in competition with other sorts of explanations? Uh, is it an explanation that is really uh, pushing aside or uh, rendering unnecessary other ways of addressing that same question. Um, and the same big question that I'm asking, what kind of explanatory hypothesis might this be, is also raised, I, th is also raised, I think, by a number of the other topics that uh, have been raised in the conference. Um, you know, is what kind of explanation would it be to say that God is somehow necessary to explain the uh, origins of the universe? Is it in competition with an account of those origins that would reference the Big Bang? Um, what kind of explanation would it be to bring God into the picture to account for the fine tuning that's required for the kind of complexity that we find in our universe? So basically, yeah, big question is, <laughs> Is uh, you know a, an appeal to God here an explanation comparable to other sorts of explanations that might be in competition with them, uh, a necessary supplement to them, replace them, render them unnecessary, uh, et cetera? Um, and it seems to me that um, you know that that's unlikely to be the case that that God is brought into the picture uh, by Christian theologians uh, in a way that would. Uh, uh, offer some kind of explanation comparable to other forms of explanation that might um, make um, uh, redundant uh, the kinds of explanations that w w would be offered otherwise. Uh, the reason why I'm saying this, uh, two reasons. Uh, part of it is, is just an inference from the history of Christian thought that you find uh, plenty of cases where um, a sufficiency of natural explanation for a host of worldly phenomena is being accepted by theologians at the same time as God's efficacy, causal efficacy for the, those same phenomenon is, uh, phenomena is also being asserted. So it, it, in short, in the history of Christian thought, you've, you, there, there's often, uh, you know, God is brought into the picture for explanatory purposes, but uh, there is a recognition that there might be sufficient explanations for the same things in uh, purely naturalistic terms, meaning by that that uh, what happens in the universe can be sufficiently explained by other things happening in the universe, that theologians don't deny the sufficiency of those sorts of explanations, but uh, they're also saying that, that uh, God remains as an explanation as well. And the usual gambit here by theologians is to say that um, that God is behind the whole thing. Janet referenced this uh, yesterday, that uh, God brings about a world that operates in that way where there are sufficient explanations for what happens in the world with reference to other things happening within the world. So yeah, there, um, <laughs> yeah, there, there are plenty of cases in the history of Christian thought where this sort of thing is, is, is happening, uh, where God is uh, not brought in as an explanation in competition with other forms of explanation, and the cases that we've been looking at over the last couple of days, cases that uh, are primarily uh, coming up with, within contemporary physics, I'm not sure represent any special problem um, in this regard. So, I mean, in short, th theologians are allowing, uh, you know, have um, scientists to form their own judgments and don't see uh, a competition between their own viewpoints and scientific judgments here. Uh, but the other reason why I don't think that God is an explanatory hypothesis like any other is, uh, you know, has something to do with uh, God's transcendence. Janet again was referencing this yesterday, 
that God isn't viewed by Christian theologians as some part of the universe, as a kind of thing, a dimension of the universe, or some special sort of causal principle among other causal principles, um, divine transcendence. Um, as I understand it, uh, it means that uh, God is really beyond all distinctions of kind that hold within the universe. It's not, God is not in a genus. Uh, if you're saying that God is a necessary being, you don't mean by that that God is um, a necessary being in contrast to beings that are contingent. If you're saying that God is simple, you're not saying that God is simple in contrast to uh, other beings that are complex, but uh, you're saying that God is uh, a necessary being and a simple being in order to make the point that God is uh, beyond the usual distinctions between necessity and, and contingency, beyond the usual sorts of distinctions between simplicity and complexity uh, that hold uh, within the world. Um, and it, you know, so that this kind of transcendence, divine transcendence, rules out inserting God into an account of why things work the way they do. Um, the uh, Professor Sharma's uh, presentation uh, raised another big question for me. Um, uh, whether the question of the conference, uh, why there's something rather than nothing, is a, a fundamentally or essentially religious question. Uh, Dennis raised this uh, question on the first day. Uh, whether why there's something rather than nothing is uh, a fundamentally religious question in the sense, or essentially religious question, in that religions would have some kind of monopoly on it, and certainly we've seen over the course of the conference that that's not the case. But, uh, but secondly, whether religion has any special interest in it, this question of why there's anything rather than nothing, something rather than nothing. And I think Professor Sharma was, was very uh, nicely laying out the, the fact that uh, this might not be uh, a meaningful question from the standpoint of a number of different traditions within Hinduism, either not a, a meaningful question or a, a question that's not of great interest and replaced by other kinds of metaphysical preoccupations. Um, why, why there might be a, a duality, uh, why um, dual principles might be entangled, but why there's anything rather than nothing might not be of uh, enormously uh, central significant for, significance for those uh, religious traditions. And I think that, you know, for me, that something comparable to that might be the case within Christianity. Um, and I want to suggest uh, a little bit about why that might be the case, not so much because there are other metaphysical preoccupations and not so much that the question itself doesn't make any sense, but that, that it isn't really central to um, a Christian viewpoint um, for reasons that I'll um, that I'll suggest in a, in a second. Um, it clearly is, you know, why there's anything rather than nothing does seem to be a meaningful question within Christianity as I understand it. Um, it makes sense. Um, it's, um, it's a real question uh, because uh, it might have been the case that the universe didn't exist. There could have been nothing. Uh, nothing in the sense of nothing created. Um, and uh, yeah, so the question makes sense because there's, there's the claim that, uh, that it might in fact have not been um, existing at all or existing in the way that we find it. And that, that, this, uh, that this idea that it, it might have been the case that there was nothing uh, is based, I think, not so much on an analysis of the way the, the world is and its internal constitution, what might make it a contingent world, but it has more to do with a claim about, um, uh, about God um, as much as or more than it does about uh, ha have to do with a claim about the world. God didn't have to create the world at all or just this one. So that it's uh, the claim uh, that, that there might have been nothing. Uh, the world's contingency, contingency is, is really bound up with a claim about divine freedom. So the, yeah, the, the question does make sense, uh, and there are uh, a variety of different answers offered to that question, why there's anything rather than nothing, uh, to mention just uh, a couple of them. 
uh, the universe exists, there's something non-divine because God is the sort of being that diffuses its own superabundant goodness outward to what's not God. Uh, this is a free act, it didn't have to happen, and that it's not done out of need. God is already uh, a superabundant fullness that requires no supplement from the world. God already includes what the world is in some higher form, or to put the same kind of claim in a more personal way. God is a God of love who wants the good of God's own life to be shared by what's not God. And this is a generous act, again, not done out of need. It's simply done for the good of something else. Um, God would be God, the same God. Whether the world existed or it didn't, um, God isn't dependent on the world for its own existence uh, or well-being. Um, now, I guess we could, we could ask whether those answers are all that intelligible. Um, I mean, I think maybe Dennis is right that uh, while the questions might be intelligible, the answers aren't all that intelligible. Um, the answers are beyond our ken, beyond, beyond our own powers of underst understanding or description. Um, but what I'd like to suggest um, in the remaining time that I have is, is just to give you some sense of uh, make some case for why this uh, question of why there's something rather than nothing and the, the, f the underpinnings that make sense of that question, the fact that the world is contingent, that it might not be, uh, might not exist at all, uh, why uh, those questions, that, that, that question and the underpinnings uh, of the sense of that question don't seem to be as central to Christianity as, you might, as one might expect. Um, and th there are two points that I want to make here. One just has to do with um, the fact that that question and its underpinnings don't seem to remain central to Christian descriptions of the world, the account of what God creates. Um, when Christians are, and again, this is my understanding of the history of Christian thought, my, my generalizations from it, but that uh, when Christians, uh, theologians are, Christian theologians are talking about what God creates, what's in the world, they don't seem to have a primary interest in playing up those features of the world that uh, might in fact suggest the contingency of the whole of it. Uh, the fact that things go in and out of existence, that they come to be at particular times, that they have internal principles of corruption, um, that would make them susceptible uh, to failure, that um, there doesn't seem to be a preoccupation with, with those features of uh, the, the natural world that might uh, allow for uh, a judgment of contingency for the whole thing. And what uh, this suggests to me is that the, that the fundamental kind of contingency that's at issue in, for Christian theologians in that question uh, why is there something rather than nothing? That this is a form of contingency that's actually based primarily on um, contingency uh, with respect to God, not so much a form, a form of contingency that the world might display in and of itself. And that Christian theologians are actually trying to break any kind of one-to-one -one correlation between that sort of contingency, the world's contingency with respect to God, and any contingency that the world itself might display. Um, so for example, the world might itself be necessary, considered in and of itself, it might always have existed in just this way. If it exists, it might always exist and uh, have to have the, the features that it displays. But, it, but it would still be the case that the world would be contingent vis-a-vis -vis God, um, meaning by that, contingent vis-a-vis -vis God, that assuming, assuming the existence of the world, I mean, sorry, assuming the existence of God, there's no necessary relation of implication between that fact and the existence of the world. So what's at is issue here um, are questions of divine freedom and transcendence, um, what's characteristic of God and God's agency, doesn't have to characterize uh, the sort of world uh, that God creates, the, God's own characteristics, the characteristics of God, God's own agency, don't have to have a necessary bearing on the sort of world that God creates. God could cr freely create a world 
whose salient internal features are marked by necessity, whose primary internal features suggest nothing about its own contingency. Um, so in short, you know, again, what I'm trying to point out here is that uh, theologians, Christian theologians, are quite willing to uh, allow the science of its day to go its own way without being dictated to by theologians the claim of the contingency of the world from a theological perspective doesn't require any particular account of the characteristics of the world itself in, in terms of uh, any form of contingency or nece necessity that would be established uh, by relations within the world. Um, now, one, one other point here, uh, that was a somewhat tortured argument, um, uh, about why um, uh, this question of why there's anything rather than nothing wouldn't centrally feature in Christian accounts uh, of, of what's in the world. But I also think that uh, it's possible that, uh, quite possible, that uh, this question of uh, why there's anything rather than nothing and the underpinnings for the sense of it, that there might have been nothing, uh, is not really all that uh, crucial to Christian accounts of God's relation to the world, particularly as you find that in creation ex nihilo views. Um, that uh, the creation ex nihilo, the way in which God is creating the world or the account of creation as uh, an account of God's own uh, causal agency with respect to it, that it's not really, uh, that account isn't uh, assuming that there was once nothing and then something and that God is affecting some kind of transition between the two. Um, so what, what is being pointed out by creation ex nihilo if it doesn't really seem to be assuming that uh, at some point the world didn't exist um, or uh, to be uh, affirming uh, at least the possibility of that? Uh, and on my understanding of what creation ex nihilo is, is about, the primary point is simply that God is creating everything that exists, that the, the point is that there's nothing exempted uh, from God's creative activity. So it, it's really a claim about the universal scope of God's agency. Uh, if God were to create out of something rather than out of nothing, that something would be what God did not create, and that's what's being ruled out, that there's anything that God does not create. Um, a, a second point that's being made by uh, the creation ex nihilo claim, again, if it's not really centered on this uh, supposition of the real possibility of nothing or the, the fact of nothing and a moving from nothing to something. That the other um, uh, main claim that's being made here is a claim of immediacy, that God's relation to the world is an immediate relation, that there's, there are no intermediary helpers in God's creation of the world that might suggest some kind of distinction between those helpers and what God creates with their help. Uh, instead, everything is created by God in the same direct fashion. Again, I'm just trying to uh, lay out some accounts of creation ex, uh, ex nihilo that are not really centrally dependent upon the from nothing part. Um, and then a, a final uh, point that I think is crucial to the creation ex nihilo viewpoint that uh, uh, you're talking about creation uh, out of nothing rather than out of God. And what uh, the point of that is simply to insist upon a, a sharp distinction between what's divine and what's non-divine, that there isn't some kind of uh, quantitative uh, distinction, some difference uh, in degree that distinguishes God from creatures. Um, the world is not something that's quasi-divine, semi-divine. So, uh, yeah, um, you know, if you put this all together, the creation ex nihilo position is not really referencing some kind of process of generation, um, uh, generating the existence of something, and, and, you know, it's not talking about that process of generating the existence of something and talking about how that happens, that in this case one doesn't find the generation of something from something else, but from nothing, uh, and there, therefore there's some kind of uh, disputing of the principle that from nothing, nothing comes. 
Um, instead, creation, uh, when you're talking about, yeah, God's creation of the world, you're not really talking about a process, you're not talking about a change, you're not talking about a movement from one state to another across time. You're not talking about any process of generation that uh, would take place within the universe uh, and that scientists might be describing. Um, and to turn the, the question around, if you're talking about what it means to be created, when you're talking about something being created, um, you're not, I don't think, referencing um, origins. You're not uh, primarily interested here in some kind of initial state of beginning. But, uh, and this again is something that Janet was mentioning yesterday, that uh, when you're talking about something being created, you're talking about the fact that it uh, uh, has a relationship of dependence up upon God that holds across the course of its existence. So you're not primarily referencing the initial moment when it comes to exist, but you're talking about a relationship of dependence that, that uh, occurs the, across the course of its existence. Uh, so it's a relationship that holds uh, between what exists in God. Again, without this focus on the possibility of things not existing, what you're talking about is what exists, uh, the fact that those things exist with the characters that they, characteristics that they're actually displaying, and talking about a relationship of creation that holds between uh, actually existing things with those character characteristics and uh, God. Um, so you're not asking what uh, could have been uh, otherwise the case, uh, what might have happened, what didn't happen. You're talking about the actual existence of things with the actual uh, existing characteristics of things um, and, and talking about a relationship of dependence upon God that holds in those cases. Um, so that, you know, even if you're excluding uh, the idea of any kind of temporal beginning for uh, what exists, uh, even if creatures always exist, uh, they're still dependent upon God for the fact of that existence. You know, they're given that character of existence by God. So I might, uh, I might leave it at that. Um, these are some of my puzzles. Uh, I gather from Dennis that the organizers of the conference uh, intended the conference to create puzzles. So from my point of view, it was a complete success. <laughs> but thanks. Right. Yep. Yes, uh, Don Mender, a psychiatry. Um, I'm not, uh, obviously, I'm not a theologian, and I wanted to ask uh, the theologians on the panel um, for some clarification um, so I can understand the relationship of what uh, has been said here uh, with regard to theology to to some of the physics that was discussed before, at least historically, uh, um, in terms of the historical development of concepts. Um, we seem to have reached a point where, it's, uh, the way I experienced the, the conference, um, where we are not able to make um, uh, rational sense out of the question posed by the title of the conference. but. But I still feel like I have some kind of intuitive sense of it, and I'm wondering whether uh, the the Eastern traditions, um, and particularly the Hindu idea of Atman, might uh, uh, provide some clue as to what that is. That is the idea if if uh, Brahman is uh, one aspect of divinity, Atman is another, and the Atman is what is the part that is within us, the divinity within us, uh, then we can somehow intuitively have a resonance of the concept of how, of, of the necessity of existence. Um, 
it would seem to me also that in the Western uh, religions, uh, we don't have much of that. I think from what I understand, uh, uh, in Christianity there is the Holy Spirit, uh, which, uh, which does uh, um, have that aspect to it. But um, I'm not aware of it in, in, um, in Islam, although I, I'm not, I, I wonder whether, maybe somebody knows whether in, in Sufism there is any such notion. And in Judaism, I'm not aware of it, uh, except maybe in the writings of, of Leo, Leo uh, Beck uh, implicitly. Um, at the same time, I, I just want to say. I think we need questions rather okay, than. Yeah, so my question is. Um, in the um, it, it, in the development in the West of of modern physics, beginning with Newton, since I understand Newton was a Unitarian, um, do you think that accounts at all for this sort of alienation of the of of subjective, intuitive resonance with the creation of the world and divinity, and are we moving uh, through quantum physics into a uh, into a sort of a re-engagement with that. Sorry to have been a bit peremptory. The thing is, we have cut down the discussion time to about a bit less than half an hour. So I think, you know, the, the quick interventions, if possible, um, and quick answers, if possible. But I think, uh, Arvin, you've got to answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'll answer it only in terms of the system we have discussed. Now, in this, in the context of this system, the Atman-Brahman distinction is not very useful, ultimately, because the system is based on the idea that the search for ultimate reality could take two directions. You could explore the external world and try to find out what is the ultimate ground of the external universe. And in that search, they came up with the idea of Brahman as the ground, the ultimate ground of the external universe. And then part of the search was focused inwards. What is the truth about me? What is the ultimate ground of the individual? And in that search, they came up with the idea of the Atman. But now the great insight of the system is that these two are identical. So I think the, 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 the scope you were seeking for some kind of a mediation to the Atman is removed. And, and they make a lot of this. They say it is not that the Atman becomes Brahman. It is not that the Atman merges into Brahman. That it, is it was undivided to begin with. It's very important. The example from astronomy is often given that people thought the evening star was one star and morning star was another star and then they discovered that it was Venus. Both were Venus. So when they discovered both were Venus, it is not that the evening became the morning star, the morning the evening. Just the illusion was lost. The ignorance was removed. It was always the same. Oh. And Atman and Brahman are always the same. Does anybody else on the panel want to respond to that? Kathy, do you? Or the, the question about uh, Newton's Unitarianism explaining our alienation, I, I, I would think the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm, I'm not a historian. That's I'm just guessing here. We've got a very big lineup of hands up. I think, Peter, you are the next one. But uh, sorry, before that, Kathy, did you no, want no, to? No, no, no. Okay, Peter. I, I just wanted to say something. not a story about what is referred to as creation in theology, but it's a story about what goes on inside uh, creation. And it's so if I, as a theist, were uh, became convinced that the eternal inflation slash cosmic inflation story was too, I, oh, so that's how God did it. You know, uh -huh. That is, he creates this total reality that contains uh, both um, uh, eternal inflation and it pops little uh, universes into it. Probably a very efficient way to do it. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't know why he would do it that way, but uh, uh, why shouldn't he? Uh, so um, 
Okay, well, I just wondered if anybody had any reactions to Joe, did you want to? Well, all I wanted to say is something that I should have said uh, when I uh, explained this, and that is that it's still uh, unknown uh, to the specialists whether eternal inflation is heavy eternal or uh, also eternal in the backwards direction. In other words, uh, has it been going on already for an infinite length of time? If so, then that brings true infinity into the picture. Uh, there was a proof uh, by Alan Guth and collaborators several years ago that it had to have started a finite length of time ago. And then Anthony Aguirre and a collaborator found a loophole in that proof. And as far as I know, uh, the uh, question is now unanswered. Uh, so it's simply not known uh, within the context of these eternal inflation theories, whether it, it seems clear that once eternal inflation gets started, it'll go on forever. But whether it had to get started or whether it's always been is open. But it, it had always been, still. Uh, yes, uh, that's right. It's all, look, these are all basically explaining how, right? That, that's what we physicists do, as Priya explained at the beginning. Yeah. David was next, I think. Could I just get in, in there? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's that's basically the, the kind of point that I was m making, maybe t in too tor tortured a fashion, but that, uh, yeah, what what's happening within the, the universe, uh, you know, can be adequately described, one hopes, by uh, physicists, scientists, and that there isn't any uh, real theological interest in disputing that in order to bring God into the picture. That, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. David. <laughs> um, um, so the super quick question is just for, for Joel. Um, I, I don't have any clue what you meant by saying that in quantum mechanics, atoms are mathematical forms. Yeah. I take it you meant mathematical forms as opposed to physical objects, or something. And if that's what you mean, I have no clue why you say that. The, the point is, there's simply no distinction. Uh, the so first of all, the, the predictions of quantum mechanics, uh, as fully elaborated in quantum field theory, are extremely well confirmed. Uh, there is no part of science that has ever done tests at the precision of quantum theory. So you have to take it extremely seriously. And according to quantum theory, the atoms are exactly mathematical objects. Moreover, the elementary particles are mathematical objects. Uh, okay, well, I have a... I have a graduate course in group theory where all of this, I mean, this is standard stuff. Ask any physicist. Yeah. I, 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 you know, I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. Um, um, so, yeah, maybe we're ignorant or uh, um, blah, blah, blah. Maybe you can explain it. Yeah, but uh, if I had to say it in more, uh, you know, in greater length, that would make it a lo too long to fit into this short uh, discussion. But but yeah. you but we can we're going to be talking for some time I suspect so. Uh. Yeah. Okay. I have, should I ask my very yes yes ask the other one yeah. yeah. Um, um, this is this is a question for Dean, um, um, and maybe it's a question for Tim at the same time. Um, um, Dean brought up something about the when, when he was talking about the fast hypothesis and so on. Um, you said look the 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 uh, the fast hypothesis. Is it more than a sociological fact on your view? Is, is there some explanation of why somebody who has more oomph to their laws couldn't regard something like the past hypothesis as a law? It is a fact about people who want this oomph mm -hmm. that the things they tend to regard as laws are just dynamical mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. Is there an argument? Uh, th I was feeling the haziness of, of that uh -huh. distinction my, myself. You know, why isn't there this intermediate position? Um, no, even if you were, s suppose you well, were full, is there something about the full oomph position 
that doesn't sit well. Yeah, no, I mean, the, 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 the intermediate mm. position I had in mind was you've got full oomph laws, oh, and some of them have the form, these are the initial conditions. Right, right, so right, right, that. right, good. Uh, good. And so, I mean, the only thought that I had about why this doesn't seem, why nobody seems to be in this box right. uh, is, is perhaps, if you're like me, you're thinking of the laws, of laws and, and the things that behave according to the laws as really quite distinct. And the laws are sort of descriptions of the powers and liabilities and propensities of the things. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Is there anything in what you so it's always going to be conditional. So they'll, they'll always have oh. this sort of conditional form. I if see. there were a thus and so, it would be mm -hmm. su such I a way. Mm -hmm. I um, uh, uh, can I just say very quickly that um, a, a lot of the uh, um, preparation this conference was undertaken behind the scenes by a number of graduate students in the philosophy and, well, in the philosophy and, yeah, philosophy department, basically. <laughs> um, <laughs> and they had quite a lot to say on the blogging that has gone on prior to this conference, and some of you participants have joined in on that. Could I just offer them the chance to get a word in edgeways here if they want to, uh, uh, as ahead of some of the others who put their hands up a little bit later. Neil, yeah. Neil Arner, um, to Dean, I'm sympathetic with the suggestion that a necessary being may be necessary for a full explanation of the conference question. Um, but Kathy's point was that that might not be sufficient uh, if that being doesn't have to create necessarily I wonder if you could say what more is needed if we if we consent that we need a necessary being to have a full explanation what what else has to be added for that explanation to be sufficient as well yeah um well if it if it's a being that has reasons to create uh, a universe of of some sort and and uh, this is one of the kinds of universes uh, that could be created by such a being and blah, blah, blah. That, you know, that would provide an explanation. And, and if the being is actually free to cr choose amongst the range of possible cosmic possibilities, um, um, then you wouldn't have a contrastive sort of explanation. Why this rather than one of these others? But, you know, you can have an explanation without it being contrastive, I think. So it wouldn't be complete. But it would be something. <laughs> Did you want to get in? Dean, you may want to lay all that each. So you began by uh, um, um, saying um, uh, this action reconciles you that a person is meaningful only if he has an answer. You don't so much agree with that. But what also seems to be a key composition of much of the study and the survey of possible answers that it has an answer. Mm. I don't know if anybody has actually thought about so much of it. Um, it just doesn't have an answer. And um, there are some, you know, examples of what sort of came to my mind, which is the recent Georgia and Newtonian equation, which has a Newtonian world in which particles spontaneously move. There's no probability, there's no determination. Yeah, so that, you know, I, that's why I didn't think the cosmological argument is super convincing. So, I mean, I may believe the conclusion, and, and the fact that that argument shows that, ah, there is sort of a reason for everything, uh, or, or that this, this belief that I have provides a sort of, uh, allows me to hold at least one version of the principle of sufficient reason, and I'm attracted to the principle, that might give a sort of coherent neatness to my picture of things. But I'm, I'd admit it's not a super powerful argument. The example I was giving seems to count against it. Yeah. Well. In fact, there are theories that are taken seriously and somewhat surprisingly in those two books by the students. That there's actually no. There. To ask you to turn on your microphone. Oh, yeah. I don't want to 
Um, a bit late. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, could I just remind you to do that, though? Uh, um, yep. Yep. I have a question for Joel, but it comes out of Dean's talk. I very much like this idea of a, an oomph discovery. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and it does seem to me that if uh, one key thing is if we're going to have a, something on light, we want to find something which is truly maximal in some senses. I think Leibniz is again the guide to this. Uh, I think Newtonian mechanics doesn't look to me to have much like competition in it or m maximal uh, sort of searching for some maximum. Uh, Joel, would you agree that perhaps quantum mechanics is much more promising in that direction? And by the way, I did like very much your claim <laughs> that he, he does away with platonic, it does away with platonic dualism. Hmm. I guess I don't understand the question. I'm sorry. Well, I mean, quantum mechanics looks at possibilities, doesn't it? I mean, I, would you agree with my interpretation of the time-independent Schrodinger equation that it's, it's looking at all possibilities of configuration, say, of a molecule, and it's, it's giving higher probabilities to some configurations than to others. And to that extent, it, 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 it's beginning to look like uh, something that might be an extremal um, no, principle. The solutions to the time-independent Schrodinger equation consist in specific eigenstates, i.e. Uh, configurations. And there are, of course, different ones, but they'll have different properties, different angular momenta, different uh, energies, for example. Uh, and uh, it's important to appreciate the lowest energy state is a perfect sphere. It's not some kind of imperfect approximate sphere. It is a perfect sphere. And we have great confidence that that is the way atoms behave because we can test it to incredible precision, like 12 or 15 decimal places. Uh, so, uh, but uh, of course, each solution is independent. Uh, and then there's, of course, uh, the completeness. Uh, we know that the solutions, in fact, form a complete set. So, I mean, there are lots of things that we know, but I'm not uh, understanding how that relates to your question of wanting to have some kind of maximality. Of course, it's also true that every, every fundamental law of physics can be formulated uh, in some kind of minimization principle. Yeah. That's also, of course, true for quantum mechanics. No, sometimes it's only an extremum. Extremum, of course, right. But that's yeah. not the same thing as a maximum. But, but it's also true that we can always formulate false laws as well as true laws in that form. Uh, that doesn't necessarily prove anything. Michael, you're next. Yes, um, um, I enjoyed all the papers today, but I wanted to get Dean to engage with Catherine a bit more directly. Because uh, it seemed that in Catherine's account of, uh, let me put it, put it provocatively, uh, Catherine's account seemed theologically richer than your account, and so I wanted to see what you thought of that, because uh, a feature of Catherine's account seemed to be that we shouldn't see God's causalities in competition with uh, the causality in the world. Um, but in your account of uh, divine, the necessity of the divine being as explaining why this world exists, it seemed that you were trying to understand the divine necessity on the model of other things we already regard as potentially necessary. You mentioned propositions, numbers, things like that. Um, but there was an element in Catherine's account that allowed for where perhaps God is just transcendent in a way that we, uh, is not subject to the same kind of understanding in terms of necessity or causality as all the uh, familiar things that we have. So would you welcome that other additional aspect of Catherine's account? Or are you trying to understand God's necessity and causality more in the terms in which we understand our ordinary uh, causality? Um, so I think, I don't know if this is on. Oh, it is. Yeah, How about that? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, what I meant to give was a very thin, bloodless uh, uh, picture of something that's sort of common to a whole bunch of uh, versions of monotheism. Um, at, at one point uh, in, in your talk, you, you s said a bunch of things about God's sort of um, um, uh, sort of overflowing mm -hmm. uh, his his generosity God's generosity uh, is what leads to there being other things um, and it's a free sort of uh, 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 overflowing and so on and so forth. There was a, l a long thing that you said that was very nice mm -hmm. and and that had sort of specifically kind of Christian theological 
stuff in it. And <laughs> yes, that's what I think. You know, I mean, that's that's the you know, that 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 course I could affirm all of that. You know, that, and that seems like that fills in, uh, makes it a less bloodless sort of sort of picture. Um, where we might disagree is whether. Um, uh, expressions like necessary um, mean the same thing when you ascribe them to God as when you ascribe them to, say, numbers or mm -hmm. something like that. Um, you know, I honestly don't quite know. I, you know, I, I kind of, I mean, I, I have difficulty with the, with, um, the kind of doctrine of analogy where, um, you know, anything we ascribe to God and to creatures, it's got to be in a different sense, and that's that sort of thing. Um, uh, I, I don't know wha quite what to make of that, uh, honestly. And um, I tend to, to just sort of stay out of it and say, I'm, you know, I'm a flat-footed, know-nothing uh, <laughs> philosopher, and um, um, I think I'm using the words in the same way, but you know, if, that's, if that's bad, uh, then, you know, Instruct me, and I'll try to do better. But um, but I think that's probably the only mm. real disagreement that I had. I mean, I, I don't know that I think. I, I mean, it's y you were arguing that that uh, uh, creation ex nihilo wasn't particularly important to lots of theologians, and I, I wasn't sure how far you meant to go with that because that it does seem to me to be a big. Yeah, no, I wasn't trying to argue that that creation ex nihilo wasn't important, right. but that it had a different sense to you know, it meant something else besides what would uh, lead you to be uh, s significantly concerned about uh, whether, How you know, nothing are. was uh, a real possibility. Oh. <laughs> um, oh. um, but yeah, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I thanks for that, Michael. I mean, so I understood so what you were that real difference I was that I doing between the two of you. And so, th Dean, you're more like Leibniz, who sees our necessities like God's necessity. Right. And Catherine, you're more like Descartes, for example, who sees God's necessity as completely different from our necessity. Yep, yep, yep. So mm -hmm. now you have labels, and you can take them with you. Yeah, quite. <laughs> Actually, uh, I've got that classification can I just, uh, issue. Uh, did, did you want to? Can I add the, something? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, very briefly. Uh, so let's suppose we're considering the version of, say, eternal inflation, where it has to start, uh, that it didn't exist indefinitely in the past. Uh, then uh, we physicists are in this position where we're postulating that there are some equations that describe it even before it exists or independent of its existence. And then there's this question of what breathes fire into the equations that uh, uh, ends the brief history of time. Uh, so those equations then seem to have a status somewhat similar to that of God. And uh, in fact, Einstein makes that connection explicit. Bernard, and then um, yes, um, I'd like to ask a question which is, uh, I suppose in a way, about the context of the, of the meeting itself. I mean, in talking, in, in, in Joel's talk, and I think in Dean's talk, one is almost, I, I think you're exclusively talking about the physical world. I mean, when, when Dean talks about the, the biggest multiverse, you're, you're talking about the physical world. Um, and of course, from the point of view of a physicist, that's fine, because that might be all that is thought to exist. But I was a bit surprised because when the theologians talk, I mean, in most religious perspectives, there are sort of other domains, transcendental domains of existence, you know, domains of mind, etc. Uh, and the question of why anything exists in mind, as opposed to why anything, is different from the question of why anything exists in the physical world. Now, I'd like to ask, I mean, is that just because the scope of the meeting is, is focusing on why anything exists in the physical world, or from the theological, from the, from the theologian's point of view, is it that the status of the question is somehow different? I mean, what exists, because you might ask the question, given that something exists in the mind, if you thought that the mind or some transcendental realm was primary, why does it then exist, come down to the physical level? I mean, that's a different sort of question. So mm. what, is the, what is the assumption? Are, are you simply saying we're only focusing on the physical world, or are you saying basically the sort of theological arguments you presented are sort of independent of whether it's really the physical world or some transcendental world? I think I could probably speak for the conference organizers mm. insofar as it's a question about that. Mm. And that is that, well, actually, we wanted to put just that sort of comment on the agenda. Uh, the question was, well, 
can we devise a question which has a sort of ordinary common sense to it and thus is in that sense a common question, but is clearly going to have a different sense in terms of what would count as an answer to it for the three different disciplines. And I think that's what we had and to that extent we've pulled it off. Um, but it is interesting that at the very end of the conference you're still asking the question, do you see what I mean? Uh, that doesn't surprise us, I don't think. Um, but I think you have pointed to the fact that what has emerged is that there are different readings of the significance of the question, each of which yields a different strategy of answering it. Uh, and I think that that is what we thought would happen. Um, and I'm, I don't, I think it's sort of in the back of our minds, we sort of thought, well, maybe something more than that might happen. But that's not the agenda. I mean, that's not what we need to, ha to happen for the conference to have done what we devised it to do. So, quite a good way of ending, but, uh, um, <laughs> uh, but we've got another few minutes. So, I mean, Cathy, did you want to say anything about that? You kind of look expectant. Well, yeah, yeah I mean, you know, I always look <laughs> expectant. I mean, if, if, I, if I understood the question correctly, uh, I mean, when I was speaking as a theologian, Christian theologian, I wasn't trying to uh, distinguish, say, physical materiality from uh, consciousness, mental phenomenon, and the categories that would be necessary to talk about them. Uh, I was talking about the, um, you know, in, in talking about creation and what's not divine to include everything, all the phenomena that we are aware of uh, within that uh, whole. And, um, uh, you know, God is in some sense outside it, but it doesn't imply that uh, minds are outside the physical universe or consciousness is, it, it, in short, it doesn't have any kind of dualistic implications, uh, if, if I'm reading your question correctly. Um, and I, I can say yeah. what my presupposition was. I, I, I take the cosmic possibilities to include ones in which there's Cartesian souls and angels and, uh, and so on and so forth, and if the actual uh, local possibility includes those, as I as I think it does, then that's part of it too. We were only, I was just thinking about these physical universes when I was thinking, you know, sort of just about them, when I was thinking about theories that try to explain why there's something rather than nothing, and that seem to presuppose that that's all there is. Mm -hmm. um, so th that was just sort of mm -hmm. in the context of those theories. I think the conference began with George, and it's going to have to end with George. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to make one very brief comment. I was very pleased, by the way, that theologians avoided the use of the word infinite in relation to God. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, uh, what, what the, I think one of the few privileges of organizing a conference is that you get to have the last word. So if these speakers could remove themselves, then <laughs> these ones come up here, and we are going to have the last word. <laughs> <laughs> you understand here first? Would you? We'll, we'll no, get together. Yeah, we'll get together. So first of all, I wanted to say thank you very much to everyone who has been here and has participated in this experiment. Um, we've thoroughly enjoyed it. And in particular for me, um, I learned a lot because as I mentioned when we started out, that one of the key things that I personally wanted to get out of this was to understand what, what kinds of explanations are out there. So throw a meta question and see what kinds of explanations are possible and how the validity of those uh, explanations and what criteria one might use to assess the validity of those explanations. And I think I've discovered a very rich structure of kinds of explanations and criteria that one could use to judge. So personally, it's been a wonderful success for me. I've learned a lot. And you know, Wittgenstein has gotten a really bad rap. You know, I kind of like him though still. It's <laughs> strange and weird that he was. And I just want to sort of end um, what I have to say um, with a quote from him. Um, Don't get involved in partial problems, but always take flight to where there is a free view over the whole single great problem, 
even if this view is still not a clear one. So I think you know not everything that we wanted to get clarified got clarified, but um, I'm really grateful for um, everyone's intellectual input. And I hope it's been a pleasant. Well, the weather's worked out really well. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you all. And I'll pass it on to I, Dennis and Michael. Um, I don't want to take very long at all. Just thanks to Priya and Dennis for uh, putting this all together. Um, I wanted to say I gave you four questions at the beginning that I would hope you would pursue more. What is explanation? What is existence? What is a thing? And is there anything? And I must say, we've not settled those questions. So I'd, um, <laughs> you haven't done very well from that perspective. But <laughs> from other perspectives, I think it's been just really great. And I want to say one thing that's really impressed me is, well, two things. The, the intellectual um, bravery of lots of the people here who are, really, who are willing to go outside of their field and to explore other related fields and, and take extreme positions and radical positions in a way that's very admirable, I think. The other thing is, is the ethical vision that informs a lot of the views that we've uh, seen here today in the physics and the philosophy and the theology. That's been uh, a, a, a consistent theme here, and I think that's also very impressive and welcome. And Dennis. Well, finally, um, uh, getting a conference together on the basis of a question um, seemed like a good idea at the time. Um, it actually seems to have been a good idea yes. in the outcome, and I'm glad of it, though it was a very high-risk operation. And what I can say, finally, uh, is what Priya just said, and that is that it has turned out so well is due almost entirely due to you, uh, not to us. So I think on our behalf, we ought to say thank you to everybody who's come here and has been prepared to take that step out of their own discipline and to listen to each other, even when the eyes did occasionally begin to glaze. <laughs> um, <coughs> uh, but on the whole, I think the, 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 the amount of glaze made did not destroy the value of the amount of glint. And um, it's for that glint that I'm very grateful, and along with the three of us, to you. Thank you very much. So um, I just want to thank, we all want to thank James Clement Van Pelt yeah. for helping pull this together. <laughs> and um, I want to give a shout out to our working group students who have been excellent and have kept all three of us on our toes on Tuesday mornings. So yay to all of you. That's it. There's a reception upstairs There's now. Yeah. Great. Yeah, good. Don't forget those coffee cups. Oh yeah, coffee cups. Coffee cups. Yeah. <laughs> and plates. Feels like we took around the Well done. I think the fun continues, though. Mm -hmm. so yeah, I think so. Yeah. Should, uh, we should, ha we should we definitely should have our working group. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, keep the working group going. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, because, I mean, oh, yeah. Dennis, we really now need to brainstorm. The three of us have I to know. open up our calendars for two things. We have to do a net cast to yeah. keep the momentum up for yeah, yeah. us. Uh, to kind of discuss how we wrap things and what we got out of it. And second, yeah, yeah. So book, James exactly. just sent me a note saying in the next two weeks he wants to finish all that. Let's just get the final report. Let's get it out.